It is Thursday, June 13th, 2024. This is another edition of Football Today. That is Justin Pennock. I am Chris Rose. Bobby Skinner is our world traveler. Have you heard from him at all on his uh, soiree around the globe? <laughs> no, and the the ironic thing is, is that you know, he's still doing Talking Giants, and we even we even haven't even had a Talking Giants podcast together where we've both been together for like the last two weeks. So, Chris, life has kind of gotten in the way. Appreciate you holding down the fort, even Bobby holding down the fort over there. If you see, I got a. It's either the the Hangover starter pack, and if you know me, I don't drink, uh, or it's a starter pack for something else of recovery. So yeah, I'm here, I'm back, and we're going to talk some ball. Yeah, we apologize for not being around earlier in the week. We had some things that get, got in the way a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to disclose exactly what's going on there with Mr. Panic, but... Literally got in the way, yeah. Yeah, yeah, literally got in the way. <laughs> but we're all good now. We're all good. Yeah. And uh, it's been nice because these mandatory mini camps have been going on around the NFL, And certainly the most interesting one, because of somebody who's not there, has been the New York Jets. Aaron Rodgers, 40 years old, four-time NFL MVP, Super Bowl champion, trying to jumpstart the green up there. And he's a no-show. Robert Sala came out on Tuesday and said it is an unexcused absence. Said Aaron was doing something that is, quote, an event very important to him. Rodgers told Sala he was not going to be there ahead of time, so it wasn't like, hey, by the way, I'm not going to be there. He was there on photo day, I believe, on Monday, and then left when they started to hit the field. And on Wednesday, Sala continued to be asked about it. He said, guys, you're making this a way bigger deal. It's not a big deal to me. It's not a big deal to the people in the building, and it's certainly not a big deal to his teammates. Is it a big deal or not? You know, Chris, I've gone back and forth on is it a big deal, is it not a big deal, and I, I, I lean more or less that it's not a big deal, but you want to know what is the biggest deal about this is the fact that we're discussing it. The fact that for a team that doesn't need any distractions, right, because Aaron Rodgers brings the distractions, and you keep going back to that quote earlier in the offseason of, you know, we need to eliminate the, anything that has nothing to do with anything that has nothing to do with winning football games we need to get out of this building, right? Yet every time that we've talked about the Jets this offseason in in any kind of critical manner outside of, oh, man, when are they going to sign Tyron Smith, which eventually they did, it's been like Aaron Rodgers. For a team that can't have any of this and needs to limit the distractions and avoid the distractions, the fact that there is this distraction and there is this conversation, maybe it's not even a distraction, right? The fact that we're having this conversation and the fact that Aaron Rodgers isn't there, so the head coach needs to answer for it. So if Nathaniel Hackett gets up there and speaks, since I, you know, I think some of these, you know, the coordinators and some of the positional coaches are going to get up there and talk throughout the spring, they need to answer it. Maybe even some of the teammates are going to get this question too. That's the fact that the Jets don't need, right? Yeah, I mean, listen, Aaron Rodgers is as interesting a figure as they come, and he knows it too, right? Uh, didn't he just come out a few months ago and say, we got to get all the BS out of the building. If it's not about yeah. football, then it, and now he's going to have to answer questions at the beginning of training camp. Hey, Aaron, you know, you told us that we wanted all the, you wanted all the BS out of the building and yet you didn't show up for mandatory mini yeah. camp. The bullshit that has nothing to do with winning needs to get out of the building. That was, right. that was his quote. Okay. So he's going to have to answer that and you know what he's going to do. Because we've seen this play out. He's going to twist it around, and he's going to try to make himself the martyr here. Yeah. So it's either a genius move by him where it will galvanize the locker room and say, look, he'll walk in there and be like, guys, you know that I want to be here. I will do anything for you. I just had something with life get in the way. And a lot of the players, I imagine, will be like, yeah, we get that, Aaron. Like, go lead us. So it'll either bring that group together or it is a gross miscalculation on Aaron Rodgers' part to know just how different New York media is than Green Bay media. Yeah. Because this is something that could continue to boil over. Now, do I think it's a huge deal that he's not there? I really don't. I don't because I don't. What is three days of a mandatory camp? What does it have to do with, okay, August, we really strap it on. This is where we really do the work. 
there's not one person who's like, yeah, that pass that I threw, that 18 yard dig route that I just threw on June 12th, that was the difference maker on in right. December in a game. I, I can't imagine that's it. Right. You know, and also you have Nathaniel Hackett that's still the offense coordinator. So especially knowing that Nathaniel Hackett's the offense coordinator, is this Nathaniel Hackett's offense or is this Aaron Rodgers' offense? Who's really who's really calling the offense here? Well, I don't know. I mean, it, you know, Aaron talks about how he's the most brilliant mind that he's worked with and his favorite coach that he's ever worked with. So I is mean, that you because know, Peyton Manning Peyton Manning also called Adam Gase one of the most brilliant minds that he that he worked with too, and look at how the Jets hired him. But he, my my point is is that and this is a credit to Aaron this is a credit to guys like Aaron Rodgers and Peyton Manning where they're they're able to do that. They're able to call the offense. They're able to have such control and mastery of the offense at the line of scrimmage that it is their offense, right? Mm-hmm. Is this not Aaron Rodgers' team? Yes, this is Aaron Rodgers' team. The Jets, is. Douglas, Sala, they're all going down with the ship or they're all going to rise to the rise with the tide as Aaron Rodgers does. And really, do any of his teammates realistically care that he's not there for these three days? I say I, no. I don't think I don't think the teammates give a shit. I am curious about Robert Sala. He's, you know, he's taking bullets. He's standing in front, saying all the right things. Do you think that when the doors are shut, he's like, God damn it. Like, the guy can't show up for the three days that we really need him here in the offseason? Or do you think he's like, yeah, it's no big deal? What do you think? I, I think... I think it's if this were the if if Aaron Rodgers was a saint last year, right? Where we didn't have any of the oh, I'm going to come back. I may come back. I make it back. I really and then even just some of the even when he was should, should have been a non-story last year after being out for the year and tearing his Achilles, the fact that he still was a story in the story of the Jets, I think all of these things kind of adding together is what maybe could get Sala behind closed doors or Robert Sala's like, you know what? This guy being here is the reason why I still have my job. And if I'm going to keep my job, then I need Aaron Rodgers to be successful. So I think it could go both ways. Where I think I think Sala can recognize that. Where if Rodgers is going to be successful, that means I'm going to be successful and vice right. versa. But then also, behind closed doors, I can very much imagine that Sala's like, these little things, man, they're starting to pile up. And like this guy's not the fucking coach. I'm okay. the head coach. I'm the, I'm supposed to be the guy that's running this team. Well, I think it's more than that. I think he knows that he's on his. I mean, Aaron Rodgers is even if he just plays so so. If he wants to keep playing, somebody's going to give him an opportunity next year. Yeah. Robert Sala, this might be the end of the road of his head coaching tenure. He might yeah. go back and become a very good defensive coordinator, which he was out in San Francisco prior to taking this job. But he knows that this is it. This is it. So. You're all in, and Joe Douglas is all in, and your quarterback's not there. I just wonder if it rubs him the wrong way. Yep. The only advice I would give to Robert Sala is this. Keep being the front man that you are. Keep apologizing for Aaron Rodgers not being there, if, even if it does bother you. If it doesn't bother you, then just say that. Great, fine, it doesn't bother you. But if it does, don't say shit to anybody in the building, even your closest friends. You know who you talk to about that? Your wife. Because if you say one thing in the building, somehow shit always leaks out. And oh, yeah. especially in New York, then it's going to be Sala very upset with Rodgers that he wasn't there. Like, And then Rodgers will get upset at that. Exactly. <laughs> so th th this is where it's going. Uh, do I think it's an enormous story? I don't know. I mean, you're the out of the three of us that are on this show normally, you're the you're the guy who's most in the Jets camp. Like, you yeah. believe in them the most based on this and based on Hassan Reddick not being there yet at all because the guy wants a new deal with one year left on his contract at age 29. Like, the Jets offseason has gone from, hey, this could be really good to, oh, boy, here are the Jets again. Are you at all, would you like to backtrack on your preseason predictions with them? No, not yet because it's, it's June, but the fact that we're talking about this in June and not... August, September, October, or the fact that the first thing that we're talking about, even if, like, I would have preferred if we're still in August, and man, the only thing wrong with the Jets offseason so far is Hassan Reddick still holding out. Damn. Like, that. if that's the first negative thing that we're talking about the Jets this offseason, or even injuries, because I even think that's a little bit inevitable with this team, because they do have a lot of hurt guys. Mm -hmm. The fact that this is the first thing that we're talking about with going 
quote unquote wrong for the Jets. That's the that's the most concerning thing out of all of this. Now, you know, like you saw, I saw this Connor Hughes tweet this morning. You know, he he covers the Jets and the Giants for SNY. You know, a good guy. I've talked to him a couple times. You know, and, and like you said, he you know he reported that Aaron Rodgers planned this trip while he was still rehabbing. Jeffs have known about it from the moment there was an overlap with the release of the minicamp schedule. And Rodgers is unexcused because you can't excuse a trip, but not a contract dispute with Hassan Reddick. Semantics, but there's no unrest inside the building. So then he, you know, he then goes on to say, I think this is an opinion, the Jets don't think it's a big deal. Not sure why the world is reacting differently. Rodgers missing these two days after being at every voluntary workout for the last two years will have zero impact on what the Jets and Rodgers accomplish this upcoming season. Now, Pro Football Talk and Mike Florio put out an article basically in response to that. And I know, you know, even I have some, you know, I know people have some interesting opinions of of Mike Florio sometimes. But basically kind of put out a response to Connor Hughes saying that he's kind of just carrying the the water bucket for the for the, you know, he's just being a Jets mouthpiece at this point. But something that the interesting point that he does bring up is the designation to make this an unexcused absence. And that's the only thing that I that I will go back to with this scenario where the Jets could have easily if they really wanted to, if they really wanted to just make this a non story. No matter what Aaron Rodgers was doing, Chris, they could have said, excuse absence, whatever. Three Packers have been excused this week. The Seahawks excused their punter who was getting married. The several Jacksonville Jaguars are excused as well. The Steelers excused running back Najee Harris on Tuesday as well. So they could have said he's excused, but Robert Sala did say that he is not excused from these practices. But then people ask the questions of, oh, well, why is he not excused? Where is he? And then Sala's like, whoa, 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 you're making this a bigger deal than it is. The way that you don't make it a big deal is you excuse him. But maybe, maybe, like I said, because Sala, you know, these things are building up as the as these two years have gone on. Maybe the inexcused absence is something that is purposeful. Maybe. You, so that's all good thinking and really good information, Justin. Do you think we'll ever find out where Rogers was? Or do you think he'll go, well, you know, that was... That's just my personal life. You know, I'm a well-rounded person. I I'm think he's a free spirit. Me. You know, yeah. now, do you think that's the way he'll go? Or he'll say, yeah, I was here. And then he'll want to try and, you know, go back and forth with the media when he shows up. How is he still going play? on McAfee? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think so. I, as far as I know, he is. So, I mean, that, that's, that's that's a great way to boost. Uh, that's a great way to boost ratings is whenever he's on next. Yeah. He'll, he'll, he'll reveal where, where he he'll reveal where he went. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you think we will find out? Probably. That's a good place for him to do it. I think I think we're going to find out from him. That's where we're going to find out. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, that's what he wants. Mike Tomlin's not going anywhere. Gets a three-year extension that takes him through the 2027 season. So you're talking about a full two decades plus on the sidelines there in the Steel City. I think this was met nationally with, yeah, makes perfect sense. The guy could be a future Hall of Fame coach, still young, in his early 50s. Why not? Makes perfect sense. Guy never has a losing season. Steelers got in the playoffs with terrible quarterback play. And then you go turn it locally, and it is not overwhelmingly in support of this move. Does that surprise you? No, because if I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of the New York football giants, Chris, and we, we are nowhere near close to the Pittsburgh Steelers record wise over the last couple of years. But you want to know how we are close in a similar way. There's been no offense and there's been no offense for a very, very long time. So yes, the stability of the franchises are very, very different where you have stability on one side and then you have instability, you know, in, in New York and New Jersey. But while you have a lack of offense and Mike Tomlin's a defensive coach and hasn't had, you know, have, we're not able, we haven't been able to get a good offensive play caller in here. I'm going to break up a metaphor. I grew up a Nebraska Cornhuskers fan. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Remember Bo Pelini? Of course I remember Bo Pelini. So there was a 
multi-year, multi-year stretch where he would win nine, ten games, nine and nine and three, ten and three, nine and three, ten and three. And Nebraska Cornhuskers go from the Big 12 to the Big 10. You know, so they would win nine, ten games every single year where they would have the one nice big victory over Michigan State or Wisconsin every single year. And, oh, this could be Nebraska's year. But then you can never beat Michigan. You can never beat Ohio State. And it would just be the same thing every single year with Taylor Martinez, Rex Burkhead, um, and, you know, those good teams, Kenny Bell, those good teams for a couple years. Those were all Bo Pelini teams. Every single year, 9-10 wins, 9-10 wins, but you can't get over the hump. You can't win the Big Ten Championship. They fire Bo Pelini. They try hiring Scott Frost. They try hiring some other guys. And Nebraska has reached the bottom of the barrel. Bottom of the barrel where they've been barely been able to keep their in-state, in-state high school players in Nebraska. And now, obviously, they have, uh, they have Matt Rule. So why I bring up Bo Pelini? is that they've won 9, 10 games every single year, and Nebraska thought, well, that's not good enough. We won a Big Ten championship. You're out. You're fired. And then they had to scrape down to the bottom of the barrel. Then they they had to just totally rebuild their whole program. So the grass may be greener on the other side, you may think, by firing Mike Tomlin. But Mike Tomlin may be keeping things together there more than we think. Yeah, I, I don't know how much the Bo Pelini Nebraska thing. I mean, that you're talking about a program that really hasn't been nationally relevant in three decades. Whoa, sorry, since Tommy Frazier was breaking tackles. I mean, let's Whoa. be honest. Let's call it what it is. You know, Eric Crouch had a nice little run, and they kicked a football in the air against Missouri and caught it. So there's been a little bit of that here and there, but that's not when you think about programs at the top of the list. Nebraska doesn't roll off the tongue, my friend. All right, that hurts, but okay. But with the Pittsburgh Steelers, it does. You expect them to always be in it. They're always in it. Always in it. I mean, she's Tomlin hasn't had a losing record. It is amazing. Now, define in it, though. Are you talking about in it for a division, or are you talking about in it for a wild card? Well, I think that they're always kind of in it for a division for the most part, because even when they're in the wild card, they're not missing... They're not missing the playoffs by much if they miss them at all. And that's a hard thing to do in in the NFL. It really is. It's a hard thing to stay in it every year. I mean, Sean McVay, who we all think is this am- an amazing, amazing coach. They hit the shitter a couple of years ago. Yeah. I mean, they di- right after winning the Super Bowl, they bottom. That's never happened with Pittsburgh. And I think there's something to be said for that. And... We know that it's just not in their DNA. Chuck Knoll started in Pittsburgh in 1969. He was replaced by Bill Cower in, I think, 91, who was replaced by Mike Tomlin in 07. Three guys over almost a 60-year span is what this is going to end up being. Holy smokes. That is incredible. And why in the world should Steelers fans look at that as a detriment? You know, are there things that Mike Tomlin has to change? Maybe his ability to evaluate offensive play callers? I'll buy all that. The fact that there's not a great succession plan and hasn't been one for Ben Roethlisberger? I'll listen on that. That doesn't mean that the right guy... This isn't Bill Belichick who does everything in the building. Right? He's not such a power monger that he needs it. This is Mike Tomlin who's working with other people presumably fairly well, has his way of doing things. Man, I don't... I don't get it. Now, again, I mean, you compared them to McVay, right? But uh, the glaring difference between McVay and and Tomlin is that you have McVay as an offensive coach. And I feel like these offensive coaches that even though they may have a a year or two or maybe even three where if they've shown proven success, right? Like McVeigh has, but they have a little bit of a low point. You feel more confident that they can bounce back because it's their offense. It's their system versus Mike Tomlin. If he loses his really great play caller, right? I'll even compare it to, um, um, who's the head coach of Washington right now? Any, Dan, he was Quinn. With? Dan, Dan Quinn. Dan Quinn loses Kyle Shanahan. What happens? He winds up losing his job, right? You know, so that's why I ultimately feel like 
if you're an offensive coach and it's your system, you're more likely to just survive. But I also don't know if the like if the grass is greener. Like like I'm not even proposing to fire Mike Tomlin because I don't even think that's the right answer. But if you even find the right offensive play caller, you have a fun two to three year stretch that offensive play caller leaves, and then what do you do? It's well, tough. The Steelers have never had an offensive coach. Never. Chuck Knoll was a defensive assistant before he took the job. Bill Cowher was a defensive play caller before he took the job. And Mike Tomlin was a defensive play caller in Minnesota for a year before he took yeah. the job. So they, this is the way the Roonies run their show, man. Right. But I think something that teams like the Patriots, I think they still have to learn this because they don't even have, they haven't even announced a formal GM yet, right? And they won't. <laughs> the Giants had to learn this because they tried to keep everybody in house from you know basically when George Young was hired and then they won those two Super Bowls and then 2007 they kind of just promoted everybody up after Ernie Accorsi retired and then when Jerry Reese was fired again they just promoted everybody up a step where Dave Gettleman was you know associated with those 2007 and 2011 teams in some way mm -hmm. and then it took them all those GMs and all those mistakes to really all right we're going to wipe the slate clean and finally get this stench off of us you know i the steelers even though again it's not that bad where the patriots oh my god just so you know bad offense post brady right the giants just bad everything the steelers are eventually going to i feel like have to do that have to change and evolve to what's happening around the nfl but how can you do that when you're winning eight nine games every year i know it is challenging you brought up something i that really made me think a little bit and it's the fact that McVay, even though he's a head coach, he's seen as an offensive guru, right? That's the way mm -hmm. he would. And let's look at the top teams in the league. Kansas City Chiefs. Andy Reid's been, he's been a head coach for 25 years. Yep. And what's the number one thing we still talk about him? Offensive play design. Yeah. Kyle Shanahan. Pretty damn good coach. Talk about the Shanahan offense and everything. Sean McVay. Same thing. Matt LaFleur, tremendous success in Green Bay. He's the offensive mind behind it all. Kevin Stefanski has won two Coach of the Year titles in four seasons in Cleveland. We think of the Stefanski and his offense. And so you are right. Like Mike McDaniel, he's not, we don't see him just as the head coach in Miami. He's the mad scientist behind all this amazing talent over there. So you are right. You're right with it as far as yeah. the some of the top coaches in the league. It's just not defensive-minded anymore. And I think that, listen, if this doesn't work with Arthur Smith, I think there's a lot of pressure on it, not only on Russell Wilson or Justin Fields or whomever is out there, but on Arthur Smith to get this thing looking right because it has been a while since the Steelers' offense has looked, looked Super Bowl-worthy. Right, right. It'll be fascinating. Okay, uh, Darren Waller, no huge shock here, retires at age 31. Hadn't been to any of the Giants' OTAs and things like that. He made the own and his own announcement on social media. He talked about a very scary incident last year where he felt like he almost died. Yeah. I think that was kind of shook everybody to their core. Uh, he has made no bones about it. He has made a ton of mistakes in his life. He says he is thankful that he's had so many good people that have saved him probably from dying young because he was a substance abuse addict. Um, let's talk a little bit about the football very quickly in 30 seconds. What does this mean for your Giants football-wise? Yeah, what f football-wise, before we get to Waller, maybe like as a person and as a yes. player, it, what it means for them is they gain $11 million in cap space since this, this was a post-June 1st acquisition. That's really what it means for them in 2024. Uh, if you look back at the trade, I think it made total sense for the Giants last year when you wanted to take a swing. This was a late third-round pick. This wound up being the Kadarius Tony trade. The only the only surviving piece of the Kadarius Tony trade for the Giants is Trey Hawkins, Old Dominion cornerback uh, that they took last year, like in the sixth round. Um, but I mean, this was a you want to take a swing on a late third-round pick for a tight end who could get 100 targets when he's healthy right after you pay Daniel Jones $40 million without a clear number one target in the offense. The Giants did not have a Malik Neighbors in the offense last year. But after the year the Giants had last year, 
Um, you know, plus we were even hearing back in January and February that he was contemplating retirement and that he was going to be making this decision soon. Even back then, uh, the writing was on the wall that this was going to happen. Uh, part of me even thinks that maybe there was like a handshake agreement between him and the Giants that, hey, you're going to hold out, maybe make this decision in June so they can make this a, poon, a, a post-June 1st cut because that would mean more for them cap space-wise right. for them this year, even though they carry a little bit of dead cap next year. So that's honestly what it means. Like it, it's, it's disappointing because, man, he looked really, really good in training camp last year. And even, Chris, he suffered a hamstring injury before Dallas game, the Dallas game week one. But I think he gets hurt again against the Jets in the middle of the season. He was the number one tight end of receiving yards. Travis Kelsey and Sam Laporta were like right behind him. I know every, the Laporta and Kelsey are always the talk of the town and the Giants sucked, but Kels, uh, Waller was number one. Um, so it, I don't want to say it was a it was a failure, obviously, the trade, but just kind of just bad circumstances for, for this guy. Now they'll have a couple of guys whom they've drafted in recent times. Daniel Bellinger, uh, Theo Johnson, whom they got, I believe, in the fourth round out of Penn State. Mm-hmm. Enormous, about him. enormous target. Yeah, so I think yeah, football-wise, there's going to be a bit of a drop-off. Um, you know, it was fascinating because he literally came out of nowhere, right? He was a sixth-round pick by the Ravens. First four years of his career, he had less than 30 total catches, yep. in part because he was suspended for an entire season and part of a season before that, trying to get his life right, which he eventually did. And I don't know how often you say a guy gets his life right and then he goes to the Raiders, but that's exactly what happened. And we were having... Talks about, okay, it's Kelsey and Kittle, and how close is Waller to him? Like, that was awesome. I think he is a tremendous success story when you look at it, once it's all said and done, in part because the guy's still with us. Yeah, and, I mean, I, I agree. Where It's a great story of resilience, overcoming adversity, and your demons, yeah. too. Right? I know, you know, typically you don't get too, you know, touchy, touchy-feely on these, on these sports podcasts, but, you know, I, I've even had, like, you know, my – some of my close family members have suffered from very similar things with uh, addiction and things like yeah. that. And to see a guy like that kind of rise above it and really didn't even have his first true breakout season of age 27. And you get to a point where, you know, we're calling him one of the best tight ends in the NFL, not even one of the best tight ends in the NFL. Cause he was never really even that great of a blocker, former wide receiver too, yeah. was drafted to the Ravens to be a wide receiver and goes over to the Ravens and uh, Raiders and to, to, to be a tight end and was looked at as one of the best tight ends in the NFL. So really resilience, overcoming adversity, overcoming demons. Uh, Darren Waller certainly, certainly did it all. D- don't love the way that it ended for him. Cause I really feel like he did have some, some good football left in him, but um happy that he was able to kind of make this decision and make it on, make it a, make it on its own. Yeah. And everybody's going to sit here and crack jokes, particularly on social media. Like, please don't take your next career up as some burgeoning, singer or you know don't do that because he's right we, we've seen a few of those not so great hits but go do whatever makes you happy man he said at the end it, i just wasn't happy i kept losing like it seemed like with every passing day that i was playing football that it seemed less and less enjoyable And when you hear that there's a lot of people that don't like what they do for a living they just have to do something in this world if you are a football player and you don't like it you better get out quick yeah because who the hell wants to smash their head against a wall 80 times every Sunday and be like, yeah, this just ain't for me. Like, wow. You know, and Chris, a lot of people sometimes criticize players for just being in it for the money. Chris, he, he passed he passed up on 11. The Giants are saving $11 million. Darren yep. Waller's not getting that $11 million. No, he's not. No, so. he's not. So good for him. Uh, very quickly on the Giants, you wanted to talk a little bit about offseason hard knocks. Yeah, uh, so th- this is this is kind of random. Uh-huh. Uh, we, I don't think we ever talked about it when it was first announced, and I think we're right in the right in the middle of that period where I think we're almost a little less than a month out. The NFL is going to be premiering. If you didn't see it, uh, their first off-season version of Hard Knocks uh, starting in the beginning of July, and I'm pretty sure the cameras are still there in East Rutherford, even even documenting manda- mandatory minicamp. Mm-hmm. So I can imagine they're going to wrap up as the NFL goes into this six week dead period, and then they're going to transition to their regular to their you know their regular training camp hard knocks. So Chris, uh, I want to get your thoughts on it because I am sitting here 
probably too excited as a Giants fan to see this. And I've even been told by even Bobby and some of the beat reporters, like, Justin, you, you got to calm down. Because the Giants offseason is made for TV. And it all starts off with Wink Martindale and Brian Dable, who apparently hated each other. Hated each other. Wink Martindale, the former defensive coordinator for the Giants, he's now the D.C. for Michigan. Right. Um, <laughs> hated each other. Wink Martindale like didn't even resign at one point, but the Giants announced that he was done. And well, it, like that's that stuff is made for TV. And then you have the Brian Burns trade, and then you have Jones recovering from his ACL, but then you also have the Giants reportedly wanting to trade up for Drake May and all this stuff. I think the Giants offseason was made for TV. Well, Am I expecting too much from this offseason hard knocks? Do I have to temper my expectations? Or do you think HBO, the NFL, and the Giants are going to green light to see all this juicy shit? I mean, I don't think you'll get that. I think, yeah, I, I can't imagine you would get that. If so, home run. I mean, we'll all be tuned in. I think it'll be nice for you to kind of see some guys who might be on the fringe and they try and develop stories and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, I can't imagine that you're going to be seeing much wink in this thing. It just should be episode one. should be scene one. I know, but I don't think that, I don't think that stuff comes out. As ugly as it sounded, I don't think that. I'm surprised. And then even do. even trading up for for May too. Yeah, I did. Like I said, I just don't see it. I do not see that happening. Sorry, bud. I don't mean to burst your bubble. I know for the Wink Martindale stuff. But hey, if so, let's let's have at it. Throw it on the grill. I'm in. I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to hold on. So here, here's what I've been saying. I'm going to hold on to the hope like I have been as a Giants fan every single year. Mm -hmm. And then I will wait to be crushed and disappointed when it happens. Well, or you could just wait till the beginning of September and be crushed and disappointed. Oh, well, that, that too. All right. Let's move on to, uh, I know we talked a lot about the Denver Broncos quarterback situation because we need to. But there's a report by ESPN's Jeremy Fowler who said that Zach Wilson is indeed in the mix for the starting gig. Are you buying it, or is that lip service from somebody? I do buy it because we talk all the time about how how and why it's beneficial for QBs not to start right away. And even if it's two, three weeks, part of me is interested to see if Zach Wilson can start and what he can do in a Sean Payton offense. But then also, you know, I'm sitting back and saying to myself, even from day one, I could see Bo Nix just being a better, more efficient, and on-schedule quarterback than Zach Wilson. So it's so tough to evaluate rookie QBs. I mean, it's even tough to evaluate them, them in camp. It's even tough to sometimes evaluate rookie, rookie QBs after watching them for a whole year, and then what are they going to be in years two, three, and beyond? So I think... Truly think this is a true quarterback competition. But even from day one, I can see Bo Nix just being more on schedule and running more of a Sean Payton friendly offense than Zach Wilson. But if the Broncos want to take the approach of playing it safe and giving him a little bit of time to learn on the bench and take these mental reps and not throwing him out there in the fire, I could also see that too. I, I don't see it. I really no. don't. I mean, I watched a lot of Zach. Well, I had to watch a lot of Jets football. I mean, I have to watch a lot of everybody. So what does Zach Wilson do great or even reasonably well? He's got a good arm. Okay. He can move. Have, he can move. Yeah, sure. He can move around a little bit. You know what else he is? He is the point guard that has a one-to-one -one assist to turnover ratio. And that is brutal. If you have one of those guys, he damn well better be scoring 24 points per game. Zach Wilson doesn't lead an offense that can score 24 points per game. I can tell no. you that. That doesn't happen. So I don't... I'm more curious if this is like the last shot for Zach Wilson. Is this going to be the last opportunity? Sam Darnold, I think, is going to bounce around for like 12 to 14 years. You know, he's... He went from the Jets to Carolina to San Francisco. Now he's in Minnesota, and next year he's going to get another opportunity still because he's in his late 20s, and he's a good guy, and he's he's big, and he's strong, and he does have some arm talent, 
and he's even been bitten by the turnover bug. But I think he's going to keep getting shots. I am curious if this is it for Zach Wilson. I mean, is he I think he'll, I think he'll still have a job. You do because I mean, yeah, he, he could go the way of Josh Rosen, who no, he could. Why do you say no? <sighs> what in the, what in his game makes you say? Yeah, this guy has to be a hanger-on. Is it because, I mean, what is it about him that is appealing football-wise? I don't know I'm not say, at all. So I'm, I'm not saying, saying starter. I'm not saying starter, but, I mean, it, where, where you have NFL teams that are carrying three quarterbacks, the Some, fact that he has... Not everybody. Not 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 everybody, but especially when you, you know, in the age of the emergency quarterback, too. It's like, not as Zach's, many as you think. I'm just telling you. I, I talked about it with Stefanski last year. He said, it's not... Don't go crazy with that, is what he told me. 33 games started. Okay. How many? Yeah. How do you do in those? Yeah. I, I know. No, Chris, I'm not arguing that he's that he's good or great. I, he's, he's bad. And, and we're, we're sitting here saying that Bo Nix is going to operate and can operate even from day one to stay on schedule. And, that, and that's the main thing. Like, I think staying on schedule is what is going to separate Bo Nix apart from Zach Wilson, where you you know you have Zach Wilson that will take the unnecessary sack, throw the unnecessary interception, where Bo Nix can, you know, you learn to fight another down. But I think just having that experience, and really it's the arm. People are going to see the arm. People are going to see the, fir- the, the first round buzz, and you can move. That, that's it. That's the only reason why he will be around for a very, very long time. We can probably agree that uh, he's got a better arm than Tyrod Taylor, right? Oh, arm, arm strength, yes. But I think Tyrod Taylor actually does throw a better deep ball, which I know is semantics, but... No, 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 because the arm strength sometimes, I think, totally... We talked about this with Kurt Warner. I think sometimes it gets overblown that you have to throw it 70 yards to truly have arm strength. That's not all. Zach Wilson can fire it. He can spin it. He can he right. can hit the deep out, all that sort of stuff. My point is this. Tyrod Taylor is going to be a 15-year player in this league, and you're not even going to blink. And he's right. going to bounce from team to team. He's on a new one this year. He was taking the first team OTAs with the Jets. um, Because he's such a good dude. And you feel like you can win games with him when you need to. If you need to over a month stretch, your guy gets hurt. Can Tyrod Taylor come in and save our season? If the whether it's yes or no, you feel like the answer is yes. If Zach Wilson had to come in and save your season for a month, do you feel confident? No. But of course what, not. What the backup, answer is, of course not. No, but what backup quarterbacks in the NFL besides Jacoby Brissett, Tyrod Taylor, who Tyrod Taylor gets hurt you know, after playing for two games, uh, Gardner Minshew, who isn't even a backup right now. What what are the backup quarterbacks? That Jameis Winston. What other backup quarterbacks besides that? Do you feel confident that you can win football games with? Well, Cooper Rush went four and one. Jake really Browning. Good team. Jake Browning. But, but the, okay, but that's, isn't that kind of the point? Yeah. Isn't this kind of the point? Jake Browning but there's, played. There's very, thirty-two very well backup the- spots. I think that, I think that's my point. There's thirty-two backup spots. You know, Zach Wilson's going to have a job for a long time. I don't know, man. I don't know if in three so in three years he's still in the league, right? Oh yeah. Okay. Maybe three different teams. Yeah, that, that to me, I think that's a possible no brainer. Yeah. I don't think he's still on the Denver Broncos in three years. In fact, he might be two teams removed from them. All right. Be interesting. Um this I found fascinating. Jordan Love came out. And said this week, I don't think you have to have a number one receiver. I think it actually works out well when you can spread the ball out. You got different guys making plays and you can put them in different areas. So it sounds like he's saying not having a number one receiver is beneficial to a team and perhaps overrated if you have one. Do you agree with him? No. (laughs) No. (laughs) Would the Packers be better with Devontae Adams on the team right now? Yes or no? Yes, I think they 100% would. So here, here's what I did, Chris. Uh, I went I went around the NFL, and uh, you know, I said the following teams don't have a clear-cut number one wide receiver. 
I put it in three categories. Like the obvious, you don't have a number one wide receiver. Maybe the not so obvious ones. And then the rookie wide receivers. So the two teams that that belong in the rookie wide receiver categories are the Cardinals and the Giants. Because they have Marvin Harrison Jr. and Malik Neighbors. Who I honestly think from day one could be ascending wide receiver ones. Yep. The not so obvious teams are the Jaguars, the Falcons, and the Panthers. The Jaguars have Christian Kirk. The Falcons have Drake London, who excited to see. I, I think he could be a hundred catch guy now that Kirk Cousins is in there. Mm-hmm. And then the Panthers, Adam Thielen had like a resurgent year, but is that just because nobody right. else was going to get the ball thrown to him? The obvious ones are the Bills, Patriots, Steelers, Broncos, Chiefs, and Chargers. So wait Those a second. Are the obvious teams. You, yeah, got. You don't think that George Pickens? No. No. And that's that I think that goes to my that could be a personal bias of mine of I just don't think contested catch guys, guys that can't separate. If you're a guy that can't separate, you're not a wide receiver one in the NFL for me. Dude, I I I mean, okay. Well, that's where you and I differ. I think he can separate. I think he hasn't had a guy that can get him the damn ball when he separates. I don't know if that's going to improve a ton this year. Because how many times did we see Portland Sutton or Jerry Judy waving their hands last year, being like, Russ, fucking throw me the football. So I don't know if that's going to get any better. I think that if you would put him with a top 12 quarterback, I think you would have a different answer about George Pickens. But okay, let's continue on. All right, so you know what? We'll, we'll remove them. We'll no, remove I, them. Don't wanna, we'll, I don't want you to change your mind. I'm just giving you a different point of view here. Do you, do you agree with the rest of those teams? Like even with the Broncos, like do you view Cortland Sutton as a as a as a like a wide receiver one in the NFL? No, because I think that wide rec- I think wide receiver ones are like aces in baseball. Not every team's got one, so I'm with you on right. that. Right. Okay. So we have the Bills, the Patriots, Steelers, Broncos, Chiefs, Chargers. Yep. The Bills. The Bills have a huge question mark right now, where you know we we haven't seen that offense. Right. We've seen the Patriots' offense without you know any semblance of weapons. We've seen what the Steelers are. We already talked about them. We've seen the, what the Broncos are. The Chiefs, now they have the great play caller, right? And they have the great quarterback. Chargers, we got to see what we got to see what right. they're all about, right? I think the I think Jordan Love's overall point, and I think why it works for the Green Bay Packers is obviously if you can complement good quarterback play, but I think most importantly. If you can have a good system and if you can have a good play caller and everybody is in sync, that's why I view it works. But I think it. W- I think you're also lying to yourself if you're saying like, uh, would having Devontae Adams back in Green Bay would that not make like I, I would I would put Green Bay as favorites. Uh, no, nah, would I? Would I? Would I? I would put them much closer to the Lions than what I have them right now. Yeah. If Devontae Adams was back, let's just say he was back in Green Bay and he never left. Um, and also, I've been talking about on the show all the time that I view Christian Watson as such an important piece is that if he can possibly ascend to be a wide receiver one and he can resolve those hamstring injuries that he had last year, how important he is as to getting this Green Bay offense to getting to an, an, an elite status. So, um, I would probably take... I understand why you put Kansas City in that mix because we're talking about number one wide receivers, but I think Kelsey is such a unicorn. Right. You know, when the game's on the line, you know that 87's getting open. Somehow he's going to get open. So I think that they're kind of their own category, Um, although I understand why you did that. Green Bay, I think, is fascinating because I can't ever remember a team where this many guys felt like they were so clumped together talent-wise that we're all growing up together, right? Last year, they, did they have a pass catcher outside of the running back room that had more than two years of NFL experience? They only had two guys who had more than 40 catches last year alone. That was Reed and Dobbs, only two. Yeah. So I think that part of it is, I don't think this was his intention, Jordan Love's intention, but I wonder if he's waking up some of the guys in there that might feel like, Hell yes, I can be a number one. Like, yeah, I, dude, I can do that. Christian Watson said, I can stay healthy and I can do it. 
Reed saying, yeah, dude. I mean, I was in my first year last year, but I, I can be that guy. You do need a number one because you need somebody when the game's on the line to be the dude. The dude. Jerry Rice in Super Bowl twenty three when they were losing against the Cincinnati Bengals, he got the ball all the time. And he had a damn good receiver on the opposite side of him and John Taylor. But it was Jerry Rice who got the ball on the game-winning drive. You need that. We're going to go find him. So, um, I appreciate him taking a look at what he's got around him and saying basically like everybody's important and everybody can do everything. But I think he's a little off on this. But that's a good point about confidence because what's what's something that the Green Bay Packers have that not a lot of NFL teams have right now? And that is, you know, cons- that's consistency. There's a word. There's, there's a word. Continuity. Mm-hmm. They have continuity. They do. Where... They're bring, you know, Jordan Love has been in the system for a long, long time, even though he's, you know, this is only his second year fully playing in it, right? But you have Christian, you know, Christian Watson, Romeo Dobbs, they were all in the same draft class. And then Jaden Reed was a rookie last year. Or even Bo, Bill Melton was a guy that, that was right. around and had some good stuff d- down the stretch. Dontavian Wicks, yep. you know, all these guys, they're all coming back together. They all have continuity while none of them are great. And I like, I really think that, I really think that Christian Watson, maybe not. I think Christian Watson could get close to being great if he is at his if he is at his top. That's how much I really liked him coming out of school. So the fact that they have that continuity all together with that offensive line, with the quarterback, with the play caller, like I think that can make them a dangerous, dangerous unit. Yeah, see, and they may not need that number one. The only thing is, is that my definition of a one I think is different than other guys because they're. People look and they say, oh, he caught 100 passes. He must be a one. I don't think that's always the case. Um, Like Jarvis Landry, there were years that he was putting up really, really good numbers. And he was an excellent, excellent player. But I would never have put him in the group of, same group of, like when Odell was at the peak of his career. Like, those are totally different ball players. Yeah. And Odell was definitely a one. And Jarvis, was. I'm not going to call him a stat stuffer because I think that's an insult. To a guy who was an outstanding route runner and had great hands. But to me, there's a difference. I just don't think everybody's a one because they catch a hundred passes in today's NFL. Right. Just, that's just not the way I see it. All right, man. Um, I think next time we're up, we're going to see Mr. Skinner back in the States, right? I, I certainly hope so. We'll, we'll find out. Okay. Keep you in suspense. Can't wait. I can't wait. Well, all these mandatory, um, uh, you know, mini camps hopefully will be done. And who knows? Maybe we'll know where Aaron Rodgers was, or more likely we won't. But it's always fun. So, for our amazing producer, Mikey, thanks so much for putting it all together. And Justin Pennick, who is working his way back to full strength and will definitely be ready for our mandatory show next week, I guarantee you. I am Chris Rose. We will see you next time here on Football Today.